Hello, Brendan. Welcome to the Hacking State Podcast. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. We're going to talk a little bit about a couple of your books today. But before we get into that, would you mind telling the viewers, the listeners, a little bit about yourself, your background, um, who you are? So my name is Brennan Murata. I did a feature-length documentary called American Circumcision, which was trending on Netflix at one point mm. and explores the modern debate around that issue, around circumcision and the growing movement that says that men should be able to make their own choices about their bodies. Since then, one of the questions that's really interested me is how social change occurs. And so I, before working on my documentary, thought, you know, you just share a message with people and if that message is convincing, then things change. Uh, and it turns out that's not actually how it works. So I did a lot of research on social change and wrote a follow-up book called The Intactivist Guidebook, mm. which is teaching principles of activism and how social change occurs. And then uh, I wrote a fictional novel with my dad called The Haunting of Bob Cratchit, which is sort of a family-friendly Christmas story. And I, I should preface all of this that before I did my documentary, you know, I was interested in just filmmaking generally. I wanted to be a novelist when I was young. Um, and a comic book writer and things like that. And mm. uh, I've always had an interest in philosophy and spirituality and things like that. And so the book that we'll probably focus on the most is the one I wrote during the 2020 pandemic called Children's Justice. Yes. Which applies the principles of critical social justice to the treatment of children. So the treatment of children is something I've always been interested in. Ever since I was young, I remember in high school reading John Taylor Gatto's The Underground History of American Education, you know, while I was being sent to public school, trying to sort of deconstruct this system that I didn't want to be in at the time, and reading the early children's liberation literature and things like that. And part of what got me into the subject of my documentary was a period in my life where I was examining early life things that had happened to me that no longer served me, that had, you know, created trauma or created patterns in my mindset that were not what I wanted. And so I went through a process of, of healing that. I went through a lot of information on, you know, trauma resolution, on psychology, on healing work. I've studied hypnosis and neurolinguistic programming. Mm. I, you know, everything that, I, that might have helped me with that, I at least gave it a try, essentially. And so... During the, the 2020 pandemic, of course, there were the, you know, large George Floyd protests, and there was this cultural message that everything needed to be done in this sort of system of critical social justice, that like every organization needed to have an equity statement, every aspect of society needed to be, needed to be you know, transformed by this movement. And I had wanted children's issues to have the level of success that I saw that movement having. And at the same time, you know, I also wasn't sure, you know, the, the work that I was doing was done in the framework of human rights and this idea, you know, everyone has a right to their own body to cut off a part of someone's body with their, with their choice is a violation of their rights, that children have rights, that doing things like hitting children or, you know, making them go to a government building where they're, they're forced to sit eight hours a day, that those things are something that is an injustice that should be treated differently. And... The children's movements that I was a part of and that I cared about were not doing that well. I mean, they they were they were you know getting attention, but not nearly the level of attention that I saw social justice movements getting. And so I thought, okay, well, why is that the case? And you know, if if social justice is about helping the most oppressed in society, the the least privileged, well, that's children in every society throughout human history. Mm. So why is it that those principles weren't being applied to children? Why is it that there isn't a children's justice movement? And that's kind of what the book was intended to investigate. So I read everything I could on critical social justice theory. Yeah. You know, there's a very long bibliography at the end. And I thought, okay, how would I apply those principles to this issue? And, and by the way, if that's true, if, you know, if this can be applied in that way, then it also means that all of these social justice movements that are having this massive success in society, that they should also be used and have the, have the same sort of um, level of attention applied to these issues. So, so you became concerned with 
issues about your own personal backstory and trauma and trying to resolve that and trying to get to the root of that. Yeah. You had already done this documentary yes. for Netflix. Um, it wasn't for Netflix, but it was on, you know. Well, okay. So Netflix took it up and it yeah. became very popular. Um, and uh, this is on the, the intactivist movement, which yes. we're going to get into. We're going to get into yes. what that means and why you chose to focus on this area um, in a moment. But just to set up for the listeners and viewers, um, the concept of children's justice. So, so when I was reading this book, um, I will have to say that there's no book that has made me so uncomfortable in a very long time <laughs> that I've read. And I read a lot of weird yeah. books, okay? Um, I mean, I just did a whole book on, or a whole review of um, Selective Breeding and the Birth of Philosophy, which is an extremely controversial book for a number of reasons. Um, and, you know, as uh, as odd as that book is and as weird as it is, uh, there was, this was, it was nowhere close. And that's an incredible compliment, by the way, that I've out weirded <laughs> the author of that book. <laughs> well, you know, uh, to be fair, that was a PhD thesis. It was not supposed to be a popular book. Sure. That being said, um, I want to talk a little bit about why uh, why it made me so uncomfortable. Sure. And there's there's sort of at least two, maybe more than two layers as to the reasons why. Um, the first is, of course, the subject matter. Most people are uncomfortable. By the way, just to put it out there for everyone that's listening, if you haven't caught on by now, we're talking about circumcision. And we're talking about circumcision as, well, as you started out uh, as a human rights issue, but is now you're proposing to turn it into a social justice issue. Yeah. And the core of this book is to basically reframe a lot of the discourse around uh, circumcision as an issue to focus on it as a, uh, not even necessarily the most important issue, but as an issue by which to, to analyze your approach to social justice for children. Yeah. And in particular, applying the tools of critical theory um, and, that were used so adeptly by various social justice movements in America to uh, aspects of children's harm, basically, more or less. And you're, you're bringing out the issue of circumcision as a poignant and very common and um, almost you know, universally recognizable issue with which to demonstrate this argument. Okay, so into my discomfort, we're gonna go. So initially, of course, the topic of circumcision is somewhat taboo. Yeah. You're seen as a very weird, frankly, um, odd, you know, obsessed, maybe you're compensating for something well, these are the kinds of accusations that get thrown at anybody who wants to talk about it whatsoever um, as an issue at, at all, right? So, so the first, um, the first apprehension that you have is like, wait, why am I even discussing this? Why does this even matter? Uh, I was told that none of this matters. Okay, so that's like the initial discomfort. And then there's a secondary and maybe even tertiary discomfort, which has to do with your method. So I have broad familiarity with critical theory. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a, a scholar of it, um, but I took enough courses um, in my undergrad uh, to know and to have a very good familiarity with some of the basic texts and basic theories involved in critical theory and, and especially what you would call now critical race theory. And intersectionality and all of that stuff. Um, I know James Lindsay is often brought up as somebody who has done this sort of like um, expose in terms of trying to go through this very um, uh, esoteric and obscure academic literature that came out of like post-colonialism and critical legal studies and these other um, studies of various sorts in the American Academy Oh, well, well, initially in the Frankfurt School, which we might get into, sure. but then in the American Academy, and he's tr done a lot of work to try to like bring this out. And he's been criticized, I think, not unfairly for doing this. And in terms of 
the efficaciousness and also the worthwhileness of spending your time doing that. But you decided, as you said, to take all the tools, basically their entire toolkit for um, aggravating for social change and apply it to this one issue. This made me uncomfortable because I really don't like critical theory and I really don't like intersectionality. I think these theories are bad. I think that it's it's almost a form of sophistry. And, um, and I'm also skeptical about the extent to which it will actually work. So talk me through your decision to bring this toolkit out in service of this issue. Yeah. So first, I just want to acknowledge everything that you said is valid. It totally makes people uncomfortable, both the issue of genital cutting itself and the tools of critical theory. Your reaction to critical theory is the reaction that I had the majority of the time I was aware of it before writing this book, which is, you know, a lot of those tools were, were used by people in an attempt to silence me and essentially say that I couldn't do activism around children's issues that, you know, oh, you know, maybe you have a point, but it's problematic for these reasons and we need to cancel you and shut you down and all these various things. And so what I saw during the 2020 pandemic and during the, the protests that occurred during then was that this theory was coming towards me whether I wanted to or not. In other words, you know, you have an awareness of what critical social justice is and I think everyone in, with any awareness of modern American politics has some awareness of it as well. It's not something that people can avoid at this point. And so knowing that this was going to come up, I kind of had two options. One, I could do what someone like James Lindsay does and resist it. In other words, I would put energy towards pushing against it and pushing it away from me. The other option was that I could do what a really skilled martial artist does and just collapse against it and redirect the energy towards something that I felt was important. And I figured there's so much pressure around this. And I, I was also having this, by the way, internally with people within the intactivist movement. There were people who were like, well, if you don't accept this, then like I, we don't know if we're going to support you in your, your, the work that you're doing, essentially. And so I thought, okay, well... Can I, so like, um, you know, can I support? There were all these sort of reading lists during the, the 2020, um, you know, pandemic and protests and saying like, oh, you need to read these books to become educated on, you know, anti-racism and critical theory and all these things. And I thought, okay, well, I like reading. Like, I can read these. Uh, and when I read them, I realized that there was there were things going on in critical theory that I don't think even the supporters of it understood what they created. And, and the dominant sort of cultural metaphor that's been used to describe this is the woke mind virus, right? It's been called that by Elon Musk, it's been called by all these public figures. And as I talk about in the epilogue of the book, there's even a, a paper written by two feminist academics that compares the transmission of feminist ideas to yes. you know, HIV and, and various other diseases and talks about how when a virus gets in a cell, it stops reproducing what that cell is supposed to make and instead reproduces the virus. And they compare the transmission of woke ideas to this. And they compare it positively, we, we've by the way. We've compared it to an autoimmune disorder. Yeah. And so what I essentially did with this book was gain of function research on the woke mind virus, <laughs> where I modified it so that instead of producing what it previously produced, it produces something new. Okay. And this version of it will not reproduce the old version. If someone really takes in the ideas of children's justice, they're not going to behave the same way that someone who is, you know, in the quote unquote woke mind virus is gonna behave. They're going to be focused on something very different. They're going to be focused on trying to resolve their own trauma and trying to change the treatment of children to something better. So my use of it is very different. And I, there was someone who uh, didn't like the book who, you know, they, they sort of insultingly described it as what if someone who had a really 
uh, intense special interest in critical theory and an intense special interest in children's issues combine the two. And it's like, well, yes, kind of like that is part of the intention. And like, yes, that is kind of the intent, but there's also a business term for that known as a blue ocean. Very often blue yeah. oceans, you know, uh, essentially uh, markets without competition are created when two ideas that are very interesting are combined to create something, an entirely new space. Mm -hmm. And right now the space, the intellectual space around critical theory is very full. It's a red ocean of competition. And the intellectual space around children's issues uh, has a lot of good stuff in it, but it's in some way a smaller intellectual market. Yeah. And so, this is creating a new space where people can talk about those issues. And, and I think the application of the underlying principles of critical theory is different than the, what people refer to as the, you know, quote unquote, woke mind virus. Sure. Okay. So I don't want to dwell for too long on um, the meta discussion of like methods and tactics. Yeah. Um, we, it will... I do want to give it a proper treatment because I actually like, I still have some disagreements with you about it. Please, please. Um, however, I don't want to neglect the core argument itself that's made in the book. Yeah. And so um, I think we should continue maybe for a few, a little bit longer um, discussing the, um, th this, this fusion that you've done. Yeah. And then we can move into the main argument. Sure. Okay. So, you notice basically that this toolkit had been developed, that there was, I like this term gain of function research, that actually almost encapsulates perfectly how, how you describe um, the realization that you were going to appro approach it in this manner. Um, and, but you say that it won't suffer from some of the other ailments or destructive consequences of many of the things that it's currently being applied to. And the reason I'm skeptical of that is, well, one, just because you're, you're accepting a lot of the cognitive and rhetorical frames of your, uh, let's just say, ideological opponents uh, in order to do this, right? So throughout the book, you're addressing issues of intersectionality. You're constantly making refrains to oh, this issue intersects with gender here and it intersects with uh, race here and it intersects with um, other components of identity or it intersects with capitalism and so forth, right? And, you know, you said at the beginning that you saw this and you had a choice, which is either you could push against it uh, or you could uh, redirect it, which is sort of the way that you described what you did. Um, but I would propose that there's a third alternative course of action when you encounter something like this, which is that you can elide it altogether, right? So, for example, on my last show, uh, I had a show called Agora Politics for two years. We did a bunch of interviews. I had a long debate, like literally one of the longest, ep maybe the longest episode was nearly three hours long of me debating a guy on critical theory. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the origins of it. And overall, it wasn't a very productive debate because it turned out that I actually knew more than he did. And he was the one supposed to be defending it. The point is, um, I made a, an intentional decision to not spend a lot of my energy, especially over the last three years, focusing on these movements and focusing on um, this entire frame of discourse, which is like sort of deconstructivist and again, critical um, simply because my attitude has always been, you should just build something better in its place, right? You should just avoid it altogether. Yeah. And if you have a thing that functions better and that actually, uh, makes people and groups and institutions better than the other thing, then long-term it outcompetes wasting all of your time and energy on this thing that's mostly destructive in my opinion. So why did you come to the conclusion that there was something constructive you could do with this? Two reasons. One, and I don't know how people are going to like this answer, it was really fun. Taking these ideas and playing with them was 
incredibly intellectually enjoyable to me. And I do think that there are some useful things there. And I want to give two frames that come from NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. One is modeling, which is just when you see someone successful, model their behavior mm -hmm. and try to figure out why they're successful and what lessons you can draw from that and if you can get the same results with it. So obviously, critical social justice has been successful in terms of getting power in American politics and in American culture. And I think there are lessons there. And you know, a lot of people on the left will try to dismiss, for example, billionaires and say, ah, oh, they just stole their wealth. You know, they don't, they're not smarter than they don't know. But I think in those cases, no, like maybe someone became a billionaire because they knew something that the rest of us didn't and they applied it successfully. And at the same time on the right, there's this tendency to dismiss things like critical theory and say, ah, you know, they just brainwashed a bunch of college kids. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, but no, I think if a movement has successfully captured power at every level of American society, maybe there's a reason for that and you can learn something from that method. So I think one aspect of, of the reason I was interested was just the humility to go, okay, they're clearly more successful at social change than the movements I'm a part of have been. Mm -hmm. What can I learn? Yeah. And then the second is, uh, you know, there's a story that Richard Bandler, the creator of NLP, told about yeah. Milton Erickson um, when he was working with a patient who thought that they were Jesus Christ. They, they, this delusional patient, he believed he was Jesus. And every single person who came to this guy, you know, tried to convince him like, hey, you know, you're not Jesus, right? And they, you know, he would just go straight back into the delusion, nothing worked until um, Milton came in and he just didn't say anything to the guy. He brought two pieces of wood with him and he started hammering them together. And the guy said, you know, what are you doing? Aren't you here for our session? And he said, well, no, like you're Jesus, right? And the yeah. guy said, yeah. And he said, well, Easter's coming up. We got to crucify you. <laughs> Like, you got to die for everyone's sins, right? And the guy's like, what? No, I'm not. I'm a mental patient, right? Like, he just suddenly, suddenly the delusion is gone. Snaps out of it. Because Milton Erickson stepped into the delusion with him and essentially agreed and amplified it. So I, I the, the, um, I'm not as familiar with uh, the origins of NLP, but I believe Scott Adams calls this agree and amplify. Yeah. It's got right? a lot Which of different like phrases. When you, when you notice, when you notice strong cognitive dissonance. One way to get people to get out of it is to do this, yeah, step into it and make it absurd. But I'm doing that with all of, you know, with all of the ideas in critical social justice, I'm just taking them to their logical conclusion. And the ones that are absurd start to break. And the ones that are successful or maybe have some truth to them become more interesting and there's things you can learn from it. Okay. And- and I think that part of the reason the book gets a weird reaction from people sometimes is that I don't always tell the audience which ones are the absurd ones and which ones are the successful ones. I mean, if you wanted, I could go through it with you and I could say like, look, these are the things I think that they really got right. Um, and these are the ones I'm just playing with. In a okay. Okay. Way. So I, I think we're risking boring the audience at this point sure. because we are spending too much time in like discursively. Okay. Instead of actually just getting into the meat. So um, I don't mean to interrupt, but Go for it. I think it's getting, you know, yeah, uh, we're having too much conversation about the conversation. All right. So children's justice. You covered circumcision in your previous work, in your documentary work. And now you've written this book. As everybody knows, you're applying the critical, the tools of social justice and in particular critical theory to this issue of circumcision. Um, first of all, why does it matter? Why do we need to talk about this at all? And um, secondly, uh, what is the initial entry point for turning this into a social justice issue? It matters because children are the most oppressed class in every society, in every group throughout history. So every culture, you look at it, children are at the bottom of the totem pole. They have the least rights and the least ability to get their rights and needs met. And it also matters because in childhood is when every emotional relational pattern is set. So between zero and eight is when someone develops everything about their core emotional personality and foundation. And trauma that occurs in that has a lifelong impact. And there's 
million studies I could go into backing up that particular piece. So my thesis in this book is that every other problem in society or social justice issue has its roots in childhood because childhood is when people's way of relating is set. And a person who has a healthy childhood, who's been loved, who is free from trauma, is not going to participate in harm the way that someone who has been traumatized would be. So every other issue, if you want to solve it, or if you at least want the people working on that issue to be emotionally healthy and capable of relating to one another, you have to solve childhood first. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I will say is um, when you stated in the beginning that children are the most vulnerable group, um, I remembered thinking, oh yeah, like that was a conclusion that I came to a long time ago, right? Um, it, it, back in my early days, when I had for, been first introduced to these theories of social justice and you know marginalized groups and so on and so forth, right? Weirdly enough, they're almost always talking about adults, right? Or at least implicitly adults, because most of the people in, in any given category are going to be adults, um, whether it's race, sex, gender, et cetera. Yep. And yet they never focus on children um, or the focus is on children, but it's like, you know, it's like, you know, the, um, the disabled, you know, <laughs> interracial child who's also, you know, questioning their identity. It's like, well, okay, that's, that's a, that's a, a story for a particular kind of narrative that you want to string together so that you can talk about those other issues, but you're not actually talking about the child as such, the child as a, a developmental life stage that everybody goes through and as the ultimate uh, origin of the final product, which is grown adults. It's such an obvious application and I have not seen anyone else do it. I mean, there's the children's liberation literature, which is very rights-based and that has its own problems that I could talk about. But yeah, it's such an obvious application and it hasn't been done. And in fact, a lot of social justice movements treat children as an end to mm. the needs of adults. That's right. There, in, in fact, I mean, I would go so far as to say that there's a kind of children's crusade aspect to a lot of these movements. The one I'm thinking of that's most salient is the, uh, is the, compl the climate movement, right? So today's left-wing environmentalists are always talking about the children, right? But it's very clear, I think, if you pay attention to their rhetoric, that they're using children as basically a human shield. The, sh the children are um, brought up in order to win their argument or in order to emotionally blackmail you. They're not brought up because they're actually concerned about the children themselves. Right. It's won't someone think of the children, not okay, let's actually think about the children. Yeah. Let's actually see what's going on from their perspective and their emotional world. Okay. So I, I think that's an interesting point. Start with children. I read a book last year called The Listening Society, which I'm not sure if you're familiar. The Listening Society is sort of the, the manifesto of a movement called metamodernism. I was trying to learn about metamodernism. Metamodernism is supposed to be the... Uh, the uh, post-postmodernism of sorts, right? What's after postmodernism? Well, it's supposed to be metamodernism. And metamodernism is a fundamentally sort of Scandinavian ideology. And because it's Scandinavian, it has these sort of um, Northwest European concerns around um, just uh, well-being and making sure that people are cared for. It's much more, um, I'd say, like, uh, inclusive focused than a lot of other ideologies. There's a socially, there's a social democracy component to it where it's also, you know, it has certain impl economic implications. But one of the things about the listening society that was interesting is that there's a heavy focus on a therapeutic culture. Now, therapeutic culture gets derided a lot, especially on the right. People will say, you know, why do you need to go to therapy? I did an interview with Jonah Davids um, earlier this, earlier I this year, about the problems with the mental health industrial complex and the efficaciousness of various therapies. And it turns out a lot of people um, are basically just really lonely. But one of the things that's interesting is that there's actually 
a strong emphasis on early childhood development and early childhood trauma in metamodernist theories that I see a parallel in the arguments that you're making. And so one of the claims that you're making, which I think is a strong claim, it's a, it's a very strong claim, is that a lot of the origin of oppression is in childhood trauma. Flesh that out for us a little bit. Which part of it you want me to go into? Because I feel like it's a very self-evident claim. So, well, well, I, so the disagreement here is about whether badness in human nature is something that we learn or badness in human nature is just part of human nature. I lean towards, I, I find it very plausible that, there's, that there are people out there who do terrible things to other people who have not been particularly traumatized. And I know for a fact that there are people who have been severely traumatized who do not. And so to me, it seems difficult to argue that the origin of oppressive uh, actions, even sadistic actions, and oppressive systems comes out of childhood trauma. So I think to, to answer that, you have to understand what trauma is. Trauma is unresolved distress. And so what looks like trauma or doesn't look, there are things that are incredibly traumatic that may not look like trauma or be entirely unseen. Including, by the way, there is a lot of research that what happens to someone in the womb mm -hmm. has an impact on them later in life and on their personality. There's an entire organization known as the Association for Pre- and Perinatal Psychology that is just focused on that. I, I really like their work. Um, and so things that occur to someone extremely early in life, including infancy, can have a later impact. So you might look at someone and say, well, they, they grew up in a happy home. They should be fine. But what was their mother feeling when they were in the womb? What was their birth experience like? Mm -hmm. You know, what, do they have a hospital birth? There's all sorts of things that happen there. Uh, were they, you know, given the cry it out method when they were, when they were an infant? Were they, did they learn from that? that if they scream and cry, that there's no one coming to help them. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of things that can happen. And, and trauma can also be an unmet need or a lack of connection. So, you know, nothing bad uh, might happen to a baby. And, yeah. and if they're not held, if no one actually holds them, then that could be a particular trauma. And then there's also the question of, well, aren't some people that they have some innate thing going on? Um, I don't think that you can separate people from their environment and upbringing. Mm -hmm. So trauma is also epigenetic. If something happens to the parents or even further back, it can be passed on. You, yeah. don't, you don't buy the epigenetic. No, I, 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 I really don't. I have to object. Um, so I know some geneticists very well. Um, th there's not really a basis for the epigenetic claim. I, so I, I would say that um, I think you should avoid it because it detracts from your argument and it's not necessary to make. I see that. I mean, you know, if we were going to focus just on that. But I'd we're probably... not, we're not going to, yeah, neither okay. of us are um, biologists. All right. So let's Mo not focus on that. Moving on from that. But what the point I'm making is that uh, what a person has experienced or what they've processed as trauma may not be visible to everyone else mm -hmm. around them. And then the way they process it might be different. So, you know, someone could just feel sad or lonely and not do anything to hurt anyone else, but that means something to them, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that I've heard it described before is that there's a process of attunement of the parent to the child's needs. That's a great way of describing and, it. And so there are certain situations where maybe nothing really traumatic in terms of like what we would as outside observers perceive happens to a child, but you have a particularly sensitive child whose needs are not met because the parents, for whatever reason, maybe they're too stressed out. Maybe they have their own trauma that they're dealing with. Maybe they're just not there, whatever it may be, are not able to properly attune to that particular child's yeah. uh, orient. I don't want to say orientation. Um, yeah, I'll say orientation. Why not? Their needs. Yeah. And so that's like one way that it goes through. All right. So... I, I will accept that it's plausible that some amount of um, distress and even malice in society has its roots 
in unresolved trauma. I can go further to the aspect of society that I think it applies to, sure. which is that if everyone in society has a shared trauma, there's going to be certain behavior that comes from that. And you can look throughout history, by the way, there are certain eras where it was considered normal to beat children. Yeah. Um, actually, one argument I specifically make in the book is around the way that Europeans were raising their children throughout most of European history, which is that when the child was born, they were separated from their parents and given to a wet nurse. So literally hours after birth, they're taken on a cart, sometimes you know hours away to someone else's house, and that wet nurse would do essentially all the raising of the child until they were at the age where they could be sent off to a boarding school. So you'd have this poor woman who's taking care of like 14 children. These are once. European arist aristocrats? This is all throughout European society um, up until 1700s, 1800s, that, that time frame. I mean, were peasants going to boarding school? So boarding school was only for the rich elite. The wet nurse aspect was okay. you know, so, right. very socially universal. Even people who worked as wet nurses would give their own kids to a poor wet nurse. Mm -hmm. And so every child in that society had this early life trauma that was shared. And then the elites were the ones who went to boarding school. So if you want to know who was running the society, that that was a trauma <laughs> shared by them. If you want to know where the, the psychopaths are coming from. Yeah. And then if you know what comes out of that is um essentially the British Empire and, and okay, the European right. colonialism. Okay. All right. So let's 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 uh let's slow down on some of the claims. Um all right. So so I, I can see the argument that you're fleshing out, which is that basically traumatized people first of all, create traumatized people. Uh, and then secondly, you know, that over many generations of doing this, if it's ubiquitous, then you get, you get it um, embedded in the institutions that are then created by those people. Yes. If everyone's traumatized in a similar way, mm -hmm. then there's going to be culture that comes out of that. Okay. All right. So let's move into the, the dirty parts. The well, it makes them <laughs> dirty. Hold on, he says, so, "Let's slow down the claims," and then. Well, <laughs> I mean, I need to get. I need so. So I'm struggling with this discussion because I disagree with a lot of things that you, a, a lot of your approach, and I don't want to be seen as swallowing the claims. But I also, for the sake of the discussion, we need to have a productive discussion and we need to move forward, right? True. And so I can't just. Object and object and object all the time. You can object as much as you want. You have my permission. Yeah, yeah. Um, so why why are we focusing on circumcision? Why does it matter? And um, you know, I, we didn't really get into that. Like, like I think it matters because convince me yeah. that I need to care about this. It's a near universally experienced trauma of men in our culture. And every person you know has been impacted by it. Every person is either someone who it happened to personally, mm -hmm. or they've become a parent, or they're the partner of someone who it happened to, or they just know they have people in their life who it happened to. So, you know, I was talking earlier about how if a trauma is experienced by the majority of a society that it influences culture, I think that this is one of the unseen, unspoken forces in American society in the sense that it is a universally shared experience by the majority of American men and it's never talked about. And yet it impacts all sorts of things around people's sexuality and their psychology and all of these different aspects of society, you know, medicine, religion, all of these different things, but it's never spoken about or seen. Mm -hmm. And an important Part of this is also that it's pre-verbal, right? Yeah, pre-verbal pre trauma has a much deeper impact. So a couple things to say about that. Um, one is a lot of people are skeptical that it even is traumatic at all because of the fact that no one remembers it, right? I don't, I don't remember it happening to me. <laughs> um, and uh, lots of millions of other American men have no recollection. And they've been living their lives this entire time. They don't know how, what their life would have been like had had that procedure not been undertaken. Um, and 
So it seems to me like that's part of the con- that's both part of the problem with getting over it, yeah. but also part of the problem with even getting people to acknowledge it is like um you know forget all the all all of, set aside all of the cultural pressures and other institutionalized reasons not to address it for now um i think on a basic individual level one of the problems that people have is like um it's sort of like saying like oh what if my hair had been um and i'm not trying to trivialize it but what if my hair had been red instead of brown i well i can't know that because my hair is not red yeah so there is really solid research that circumcision has a lasting change in behavior that it produces. And that research is acknowledged even by pro-circumcision medical organizations. They did a study where uh, infants who were receiving vaccination later in life, you know, there was a group of them that responded much more dramatically to pain. And they were trying to figure out you know, why is it that one group just is having this incredible ab reaction to pain. And what they found is that the group that had that reaction was the circumcised infant. So this is infants you know, receiving a vaccination between age four and six. Yeah. Um, and what the researchers concluded from that was that they were having a PTSD response. That so, so they had a painful experience during circumcision, mm-hmm. and then you know they received this other pain four to six months later, and it triggers the somatic memory of that previous experience and causes a change in behavior. And a change in behavior is a form of memory. So, you know, somatic memory is is something that is not like narrative memory. It's not something that you could tell a story about, but it is a felt sense in the body. It's very similar to what animals have. You know, if you were to to you know, like beat your dog, then your dog would flinch if someone came in the room or picked up the object it was beat with. And your dog couldn't tell you a story about, oh, well, my master's been beating me, but it would have a somatic memory, a sort of imprint of that experience that would cause it to change its behavior. And you can tell, you know, when an animal has been abused, it acts differently. And humans are the same. If there is a incredibly negative somatic experience early on, like say someone taking a knife to a child's genitals, they're going to have changes in behavior later on. So the research on that is really clear. And then there's a sort of idea, well, even if, you know, something happened, you can't know, uh, but you can. I mean, you can actually just take your finger and run it along the skin above the scar line and mm-hmm. below the scar line, and there's yeah. a sensation difference. Um, and there's, you know, all sorts of behaviors that people have around sexuality that uh, can be different depending on what sort of, you know, circumcision they've received. And there's a lot more, I mean, yeah, a lot right. more I could say on that, but that's sort of a, you know, that would be more graphic discussion. Okay, okay. So if I accept... So we're obviously we're not going to get into some of the gory details. Sure. Um, there's some of that in the book, although I will say the book doesn't really focus on that aspect as much. Yeah. Um, it's more about just justifying the, the, the pain involved, the, the brutality, the, uh, level of alienation that's required on behalf of the, the, the doctors and the people performing the procedure. Yeah. Um, all of that is part of, you know, continuing the practice. Um, so let's get into some of the, um, I guess, ways in which you've decided to start employing these tools, as we described earlier. Sure. To, you know, I, I mean, assuming your your goal is to eradicate this practice. You're, you're pausing and looking at me like you're waiting to no, see no, if that's it's true the, or not. No, no, that's the end of the question. <laughs> um. But I want, I want to acknowledge the challenge that I've set up with you for this book, because part of, you know, I think a lot of people have this idea that when someone speaks about a book on a podcast, well, you can just give me the hour long summary, Mm -hmm. but this is like a very meaty book where I'm taking an idea and I'm building on that idea and building on that idea. And so I think you're, that's some of that's coming out in this conversation where there's the challenge of like, okay, before I can get to this later idea that's interesting and we should probably talk about, there's like three ideas you put underneath it where if the audience doesn't get that, they're not going to understand the, the thing yeah. that's on the so, top. So I think, you know, I have a bunch of notes. That's why I took my phone out. Yeah. Um, and I took literally notes on every chapter that I read about the main points that I got from the chapter. Yeah. And we could try to go through. We don't have that much time. 
and, you know, go piece by piece, one, one step through another to step everybody through the logic. Um, but I think hitting home with, with first getting rid of some of the reservations that people have about the discussion of this topic in general, and then accepting that it's a valid issue. Those are like the two big things that I think we could accomplish. Sure. And then from there, I do want to get into some of the like actual tactics involved because I think the tactics are interesting. Um, as well as I haven't fully, you know, absolved my discomfort. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about my rhetorical discomfort. Sure. Um, so let's continue down this line about traumatized children, traumatized, turning into traumatized men. It's happening to most Americans today. Um, there's different data on the rates. The 50% is what I've heard. It's 90% of, of American men who are just of any age, 50% mm -hmm. of the children born today. And it really varies a lot by state. And the data is not very good because the, the incentives are all over the place in terms of collecting that data. But you, one of your claims in this book is that it is a kind of industrial complex. Yes. A kind of medical industrial complex around yes. this practice. There are other medical industrial complexes we're going to be talking about later on the show. Um, not this particular episode, but that I want to get into. Um, but you're basically saying that the reason this is perpetuated. So first of all, there are some religions, which you also address in the book, Judaism, for example, where it's a common practice. And maybe people can defend it on religious grounds. You sort of make the case that it's not defensible. But either way, um, it's kind of hard to do from outside the religion. But most of the people practicing it today are not practicing it for any particular religious reason. They're practicing it for a like sociocultural or mimetic reason. Yeah. But you're saying that there's also this more sinister reason, which is that a lot of people are making money doing this. I, I think the big motivator is really trauma and culture. In other words, um, there are people making money on it. And at the same time, I don't think the money alone is a motivation. And there's aspects of the practice that they don't make money on, like forcibly retracting children. So as an aside, you know, that when, when children um, are born and left intact, that part of the body is fused to the head of the glands and uh, pulling it away is, you know, before it becomes mobile when they're in older or in puberty is harmful. And yet uh, the majority of parents of intact children report that doctors try to do this to them. So in that case, like there's no money to be made in doing it. It's just malpractice. It's just harmful. Um, and at that point, it seems to me more like there's a, only a, a psychological or cultural explanation. Mm -hmm. And I really do feel like culture and, and trauma is in some way more motivating than money. So there's this idea in a lot of political discourses that you know, humans are rational actors and that they're just trying to you know, go about their own interests in the best way they can. And if, when I look at people's behavior, I see a lot of behavior that totally goes against people's interests that they're doing. Like people do all sorts of self-destructive things. And then as a, a culture, the culture does all sorts of self-destructive, like people collectively do self-destructive things. Mm -hmm. And that to me makes a lot more sense if you explain it through childhood patterns, through that they're acting out something that they learned in childhood or a cultural thing they were socialized into. And that that is coming out in adulthood in some way. So right. I, I, there is so, an industrial complex. And at the same time, I, I still think the cultural is in some way probably the bigger, bigger issue. So I want to talk a little bit about what I think is a somewhat nuanced anthropological point, which is that in some respects, we're all traumatized by our culture. And this trauma is necessary. So what, what are you defining as trauma there and necessary there? What I mean is that every human being that's ever lived has grown up in some kind of cultural system, whether it's a tribal culture or, or, or whatever. And um, 
because we're mimetic creatures, because we learn by imitating one another and by wanting to fit into the group, initially literally for survival. I mean, if an infant or even a small child will just die if they're left by themselves. Um, we have an innate uh, desire to be be accepted and be, to be liked by others and to fit into the cultural mold that we are, uh, that we are born into. And in developmental theory, they'll even describe, you know, what is a mature adult? Well, a mature adult is somebody who's taken the cultural program that they were given and, you know, properly integrated into it, right? Mm -hmm. You become a, a, a functioning member of society. Um, and that entire process from birth through childhood and to adolescence, early adulthood, even into middle and late adulthood, always requires a kind of cleaving off of the various parts of you uh, to the extent that we can imagine that there's some sort of oh, inner I self. I completely disagree. Okay, so well, let, me, let, me, just, let me. me make the point. Okay. A cleaving off of parts of you that um, don't fit into the mold. There's a kind of damage or violence that's done to every individual that's part of becoming a man or becoming a woman. And this is universal. It's in every culture. And really the debate for me isn't, okay, was violence done to you? It's really more about, was it done excessively? Was it done in a counterproductive manner that makes you less excellent than you would otherwise be? And um, to go back to my, a little, just as a refrain to my previous interview about selective breeding and the birth of philosophy, I would argue that to the extent that we curtail individual differences among people in our culture, it should be in order to make them more um, impressive, more excellent versions of themselves. But all of that requires a kind of harshness. So I agree with you that every culture in the world practices this, that their method is essentially to remove the parts of a person that do not fit with the program of that society. Mm -hmm. And that's trauma and that's what I'm trying to change. Okay, <laughs> but but there has to be something, right? Like, so if I, if I have a bunch of children and I, I take them to a park and there are other children at the park. Yeah. Okay, and Timmy uh, decides that uh, it is his innate desire as an individual animal because, you know, that's what humans are. We're just domesticated animals. Um, that he wants to uh, go around with a toy shovel and slap all the other kids with it because that to, to Timmy would be fun. Like Timmy's id says, this is a good idea. I want to do this. Well, I, as a parent or as Timmy's caregiver, have to teach him that that's not acceptable. That's not allowed. In some extent, to some extent, I am telling Timmy that that part of himself is not okay. Oh, but you you can teach him that the behavior is not okay or is unacceptable there, there's a boundary there without teaching him that the feeling behind it or the part of him or the part of his consciousness is not okay that's the distinction i would make there are behaviors that might not be okay but the part behind them needs to be understood and loved by the parent in some way okay so this is good we're making progress so we're moving into channeling the parts of you into more productive. My next book's going to be all about this, by the avenues. way. Avenues. Just FYI. <laughs> right. Um, so the way that trauma impacts a person is that what you described, um, something occurs to the child and a aspect of their consciousness is not safe or okay in that situation. Mm -hmm. So let's say um, the child has a meltdown and the parent goes, don't get angry with me. Well, now their anger, the part of them that's angry is not safe in that situation. It's especially not safe if the parent goes further and you know abuses them or hits them or something like that. So what you're going to have is a split where the part of them that was angry is going to go into their unconscious. It's going to be a part of them that isn't safe. That's something they feel like they have to hide from the world and maybe even from you know, their, their conscious mind or themselves. Uh, and the part of them that was safe becomes the external personality, right? So... They might be the most, the, you see this, by the way, especially with uh, people raised in really strict religious environments, that they're the most obedient, you know, they're so good, they're such a good kid. And then they go off to college and they go crazy and the parents are like, ah, college corrupted. No, 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 like 
they just weren't safe acting out. And they went from an environment where it was not safe to act out to an environment where it was. And that part of them was never integrated or loved. They didn't know how to process it. So it just came out when they were put in another environment. And you'll see this with, you know, traumatized people will turn into essentially unregulated children mm-hmm. when they have a, a an ab reaction or, a, you know, some sort of trauma response. When they get triggered. Exactly. And you, by the way, you look all throughout society and see triggered people acting out their little kid patterns. Um, but that is the result of this splitting that occurs in childhood. And I think that is the way that every society treats children. And by the way, uh, circumcision in the earliest myths of circumcision for both male and female genital cutting are based in this idea. So if you go back to like the early African tribal myths around circumcision, the idea of it is that you have to remove a part of a person that is not useful for their identity. So in men, that means moving the foreskin, the part of a man that is, you know, wet and enveloping is the feminine in men. Yeah. So you have to take that out to make them men. And with women, it's removing the clitoris. It's removing the part that is hard and erect and sticks right. out. So, 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 okay. Yeah. So, so, so this is part of the, this is actually an interesting part of the book right, yeah. as well, which is that there's obviously lots of cultures that practice both male and female genital cutting and, or mutilation in some cases, and that. It actually is a. Um, it is a physical uh, so, so, representation of the internal trauma that almost every culture practices around children. Right, but it's also a, a component of gender differentiation. Yes, I won't say that it's a gendered practice. So, so part of my discomfort with working through this book, literally, like on every page, I'm like, I'm like twisting in my stomach, <laughs> is because you're constantly using all this language from social justice, and. I wrote an essay uh, in college for a nonfiction creative writing course, which is a weird course to take, but I did a concentration in English, so I had to take all these English courses. And um, I decided, because I was a little bit of a troll, that there's there's a famous video um, by a former KGB spy named Yuri Bezmenov. Yeah, I'm familiar with this. Okay, so the Yuri Bezmenov tapes are a series of tapes where he goes through this process of um, ideological subversion of the United States. It's pretty popular on the internet. It it still gets passed around from time to time. Lots of people watch it. And so what I did for this creative nonfiction class is I wrote an essay. And and by the way, the rule in this class was that whatever we wrote, uh, we we would all write our essays and then they would get shared around, okay? So I chose on my, the day that my entire essay was gonna get shared with the whole class to write this essay on these YouTube tapes of Yuri Bezmenov on uh, ideological subversion, right? And I titled it A Heretic's Guide to Ideological Subversion. It's actually up on the internet. People can go find it. It's not very good. And because it was for this creative nonfiction class, there's just some other stuff in there about my grandma and stuff that no one cares about. But the point is, when I wrote this essay, I turned it in and I was reading a lot of uh, Curtis Yarvin at the time. Well, at the time, mentioned Menchus Moldbug. And he had the style of writing that was in tandem with the Heretic's Guide to Ideological Subversion. Um, the only way I could describe it is uh, coercive. It was coercive in the sense that like while you were reading it, you could tell that the author was trying in very intentionally to perform a kind of psychosurgery on you and change your mind. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason why this book had such a strong reaction in me is that when I'm reading it, I can tell that you're employing all these tactics that are trying to lead me down a certain way to change my mind. And as a very mentally flexible person, uh, this made me extremely uncomfortable because I'm like, I can tell that what you're doing is you're trying to change my mind and you're using these various tactics um, that are easily recognizable. And my... My defensive response to that is like, is like, you know, F you, you're not going to, you know, use your little tricks on me. So let's talk a little bit about some of those tactics. You adopt these tactics from social justice theory. Yeah. I will say I'm totally transparent about it. Like yeah. I'm not. Oh, well, well, okay. So one thing people should know, and you know this because yeah. you studied hypnosis and persuasion, is that one of the best things about persuasion is that it works even if you know it's being done to you. People don't know this. They think that like, oh, once I'll know, once I know what he's doing, then it won't work because, yeah. you know, the spell is, has been, you know, I, I've named it, the spell disappears. That's not how it works. 
good persuasion actually works even if people know consciously that you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, so what aspect of that do you want to talk about? Because well, I want to I want to talk about some of the tactics. Like I want to get into okay, so okay, so yes, yeah, so the under you in the change in the second, meaning of words, yeah. right? There's this social constructivist paradigm where you say you borrow from Foucault and you borrow from other theorists where you say, yeah. look, if we start changing the language around this practice and we start changing the meaning of words, we're not going to get into some of the more extreme words and you know what they are and people that read the book will know what they are um, for the sake of this pod, just for search engines and so forth. I understand. Yeah. Um, but you use that, you say, look, one of the ways that we can get power in these institutions of society is by changing the language around them because there's power implicit in the language. The language is the language that we have available to us. The lexicon frames the entire discussion before we even have it. Yeah. So, uh, the first chapter is just laying out like why write this book? What is this book going to be about? The second is this is the method that I'm going to use to apply critical social justice principles to the treatment of children. And I lay out five principles. And the last one is that to achieve power, you change language. And it's very much derived from Michel Foucault's theory of power knowledge, which is the idea that every system of power rests on a system of language. And, and later on in the book, I give the example of, you know, if someone came to you and said, um, Hey, our, uh, you know, we're going to take this person and um, kidnap them. And unless they give us money, you would think that that was an injustice. And if someone gets locked up for not paying their taxes, well, that's okay because we have this language of taxes and government and all this, you know, system around it. Mm -hmm. And essentially, if you can, you know, this is the sort of the thesis that also critical social justice is used to achieve power is that if you change language, then you can change all sorts of other things in society. And, and I go further, I get really into the ideas of epistemic injustice and this one concept from it called hermeneutical injustice, which is basically that idea that if you don't have the language to express an injustice, then you can't solve it. So before you can solve any problem, you need the language to talk about it. And even this conversation, you know, we have to define what do we mean by critical social justice and trauma and all these things. And part of the challenge of it is that the the things that I'm doing that are new, we have to like explain what each word means. And and at one point it was like that for the concept of trauma, like even just what, okay, so like this thing that happened in the past matters today, why? Like, oh, because of trauma, right? Or um, even well, trauma was actually, you know, originally literally just physical trauma, right? right. The trauma and unit. That word has been expanded, obviously. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the, there's a later book that I might write at some point just around language. And uh, part of, part of, if I was to write that book, the part of the thesis would be that we have you know, language has a literal definition, but there's also our symbolic associations with it. And a lot of the time, if you change the literal definition of a word, the symbolic associations remain and all of the things that people feel about it. And so I think that part of your reaction in the book might be that you have an association with critical social justice in a lot of the terms that comes from the way that other people have used them. So you've had past experiences with the wor these words mm -hmm. and like, Honestly, a lot of people using those words don't create great experiences with the people they talk to. Um, and then I'm using them in a different context and sometimes with a different meaning. I'm being totally explicit that I am using these words to mean something different. And yet the emotional feeling from those previous encounters still carries over. Yeah. Because like, that's how human beings work. Like that's how, um, you know, anchoring is you have an experience with something and then you develop a felt sense around it. And it doesn't matter that the new experience might be different. Like you've still got that other thing from the past. Am I expressing fragility? Oh, I mean, <laughs> so this is a, a funny aspect of, of the book is that I think the concept of, um, I would say no, because you're consciously talking about it and, and examining it. I, okay. So you're not just getting defense mechanisms all over the place. Yeah. I mean, the, the term fragility is typically used to describe the defensive maneuver someone goes into to avoid seeing how they participate in an oppressive system. Well, do, do you know what a Kafka trap is? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. I know where you're going with this too. Cause for, it's funny. Like, uh, I, I, I shared some, okay. Uh, for, for the, for the listeners, a Kafka trap is a technique whereby, you know, someone's, uh, 
um, defense against an accusation uh, basically is brought up as proof of their guilt. Yeah, if you disagree with me, it just proves I'm right. Right. And and fragility is often uh, that concept is accused of that of saying, well, your refusal to agree with me shows you're just being fragile. And it's funny because when I have taken the ideas of this book and spoken with someone who was deeply into critical social justice theory, like true believer, um, they'll start arguing with me and say, well, if you use fragility that way, then, you know, like... You can just use that as an excuse to be mean to people, and then they they can't fight back against you. And it's like, go on, <laughs> you know. It's the like, what, what do you mean? Like well, to well, reference our is... earlier discussion, like, oh, I'm not Jesus. I'm a crazy person. You know, like it's this, the the moment where they become lucid and like, oh, I guess it can be used that way. Yeah. Well, so that's why I'm trying to find out what you're actually up to. But the uh, both of it's well, it's a case where both things are true. Mm -hmm. It is true that you can use the concept of fragility to excuse, uh, essentially to, 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 to essentially push back against any disagreement. And at the same time, it is also true that when these issues come up, people get really defensive and there are some really defensive maneuvers that people engage in to avoid talking about them or to avoid actually examining them. I think it's a case where both are true. Mm -hmm. And um, that's also why the book is uh, written the way that it is, because sometimes both are true. Like, it is true that this can be go, go to absurdity, and there's also a truth there. Um, and in the case of this particular, you know, the concept of fragility as it's applied to, to talking about children's issues, I think with all of that, this, the reason that people become defensive is because they feel that if they're wrong yeah, or that if they – uh, are are seen as wrong in some way that bad things will happen to them because that is the way that our society is currently set up and that's the way children are treated. If you're wrong, you're punished. Well, I wasn't even sure if I should have this discussion. Really? I mean, I, when I was reading the book, I was like, I, I don't know. You're like, who have I invited on this podcast? Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, look, um, I think the other component of this is that there's an aspect of guilt that a lot of people might feel mm. uh, because, you know, there's a lot, I, I will say there is because of the transformations in language that are performed. Yeah. It, it does come out as if you are intentionally demonizing uh, people on the other side, as well as people that participate in this system. And so what I think is part of the struggle for a lot of people, I don't have children yet. Um, so I haven't done anything to my future children, but, um, a lot of the people that read this do, yeah. um, is that, you know, they've participated in this yeah. in many cases and what you would do about that. And I also think for an individual reading this, even who doesn't have children, there's a component of, um, admitting, you know, that maybe you have been harmed in some way. Yeah. And as a man, I would just say that that's usually frowned upon. I mean, I know we have this whole therapeutic culture and everyone needs to go to whatever. Um, but generally speaking, you know, men are not supposed to show weakness. Men are not supposed to um, talk about their traumas, talk about bad things that happened to them. And so if you are a man, I think there's a... Um, an inherent skepticism and maybe even a kind of um, uh, you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, there's a kind of punishment that can come from other men just for showing any kind of sensitivity yeah. or signs of weakness. And it seems as if a man reading this who is subjected to this procedure might perceive like, OK, well, this happened to me. It sucked. It's bad. I wasn't, you know, I had no control over it. So it would be if it would be putting myself in a weak frame to even talk about it. So there's a reframe that I would like to offer there, but before I do, I want to address the meta conversation, which is this is a high conflict book. Mm -hmm. Like I am not shying away from conflict with it. In fact, I'm intentionally saying it's and provocative. Right, exactly, and I know it is, and I think that most people, when they engage in conflict. The intention behind that is harm. 
And my intention behind this book is connection. I actually think that if you can have a conflict with someone and resolve it and have a dialogue around it, there is greater connection that comes from that. And so there has been a large cultural conversation around um, just critical social justice theory in general. And there's also one I would like to see happen around trauma and children. And the book is intentionally provocative to provoke that conversation. And so I, I can see how someone might read it and think, oh, like, is he going to be out to get me? Like, is this person going to be really aggressive? And it's like, no, I am pushing really hard for the conversation. And yeah, sometimes intentionally like pushing a button to try to make that conversation happen. Because what I notice that often often occurs around this is that people are very sort of, you know, they uh, they want to sort of gloss over the the hard issues and the, the challenging aspects of it. And one of those that you brought up was um, men's feelings around this, the idea that essentially if men admit weakness, they're sort of losing face or losing status in some way. And that, I think that that is a frame. It's one of those things where I've reframed it so much within myself, it's almost hard to relate to. Um, it implies that if you accept these beliefs that you're somehow, like it's almost an idea that you should live in denial um, because if you just deny like all the bad things that have happened to you in your trauma and you just, you know, avoid that, that like you'll be stronger when I actually think the opposite well, is true. It's when you acknowledge it I, and start dealing with it, that the strength comes. Okay. Okay. So I'll make a point about, I'll make a point about, uh, the whole discussion about men and, and trauma and therapy culture and all of that, which is that I think one of the things that probably should be discouraged and right, like is rightly discouraged is, um, a, expression or recounting of trauma as performative, right? So if instead of having this discussion like we're having it right now, we decided that actually we're just going to talk about all the bad things that happened to you. Oh, if I was like, what was me? I am a victim. Well, well Everyone not, look at not, not me. Even, not even just that, not even self-victimization, but actually just that it's, it's not productive and it's not useful to actually re like healing or recovering to have that conversation in public. There are certain conversations that actually just should happen in private. Yeah, actually, there's a really great book on uh, healing from men. I th think it is called uh, Swallowing the Snake by Tom Golden. Mm -hmm. um, I might be getting that title slightly wrong. But one of the things it talks about is that men, one of the way things that really helps men in their healing is creating a sacred space in some kind in which it can occur, where you don't have to hold space for other people, where no one needs you to be, you know, doing something for them, essentially. And I, I would agree there that um, uh, creating a boundary or sacred space for your healing is uh, probably good and that uh, pu the public spaces are not that. Hmm, right. And there's this aspect of um, of losing face. You know, you talked about it. Um, I, I do get this feeling that as men, there's this kind of like, and again, I, I I almost hate talking about it because it's like too um, overplayed right now. Like I do feel like in our cultural moment, uh, I would like men to be more like men. <laughs> but yeah. but that being said, there is this kind of attitude of like anything bad that happens to you as a man, you just stuff it down. You just bury that shit and no one ever sees it and nobody ever finds out about it. You don't tell your wife. You certainly don't tell your kids. You don't tell your parents. You, you know, your male friends. I mean, I know some people have very good male friends who they can confide in, but a lot of male friendships are somewhat shallow or they're based only in common activities, which is a valid and good rule for men to uh, build relationships upon. But they will shy away from any deeper discussion about hardships or feelings beyond, you know, something extreme like a death in the family or something like that. For the most part, men are, have an almost aversive, like re repulsive reaction to um, the discussion of any of this stuff at all. Yeah. Um, there's research that shows that if you talk about a traumatic experience, it is painful the first one or two times you talk about it. 
and then it's gone. And so I think that um, the 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 toll that this takes on people is the, holding the psychological defenses of not talking about it. And so one like I, I, I totally every time person I talk with about this issue, there's an initial discomfort. But I'm yeah. like I'm past it because you know I did a film and. Um, it's been on all the platforms, including Netflix, and like I've talked about it a lot. Yeah, everybody and, knows, you know, like you're the guy, right? And and um, like I also don't, I have not experienced a loss of face. Let me put it that way for mm-hmm. myself. Um, but that's also because the place I am coming from with this issue is a position of strength, and like I'm comfortable with it. Um, it's not, uh, I don't feel like there's any, like I am at the same power level. If anything, it's gone up the more that I, you know. <laughs> I become in- more powerful. Yeah, like integrated things and become more comfortable to speaking. Mm. Uh, it is simply, I think it's because people make it a part of their identity through language that they say, I am circumcised or like, you wouldn't speak about any other surgery that way. You wouldn't say like, I am shoulder surgery, right? Yeah, I had my uh, gallbladder removed. Yeah, you're not My like, gallbladder is missing. I you're am not, You're not an un-gallbladdered person, right? Yeah. It's, it's, so they make this an aspect of identity uh-huh. when it's actually just a thing that happened to them. Okay. Um, so I want to move into kind of the the 1,000 foot view of this. Sure. We've gotten into the weeds a little bit. We've talked about some of the responses people have. Uh, We've talked about my own response. We've talked about the tactics that you're using, your decision to appropriate social justice, critical race, uh, critical theory generally. Um, And it's important to remember that throughout this discussion that we're using this, this one issue as actually a microcosm for a broader kind of, um, dare I say, activist project that you have, which is really the, um, w- which is really just treating children almost like a protected class in some ways, um, but simply acknowledging the damage that's done to children, the damage that is unnecessary in our society, the violence that's enacted upon them, and really making the case for children's rights. Um, you talked in the very beginning of the book that you were coming at this for many years and the institutional um, approach to this was based in uh, in human rights doctrine and human rights theory. And part of what's novel about this book is that you basically abandon that and you say, well, that framework, it's too old. People know it already. It, it doesn't work as well as it used to. We need something else. Um, so where do, where do you, sorry, where do you see this going in terms of if if we take this as an example, as a playbook, what kinds of society could we be building if we took children's well-being, children's rights um, more seriously? The best description I could give is it would be a society free from trauma. It would be all the all of the discussions and problems that we face might be pretty similar. But the people having those discussions would be integrated whole people. And I think it's really obvious to see in any political discussion, pick your pet issue, whatever it is, that the people having that discussion are not whole integrated people. They're coming from all sorts of personal stuff they've got going on. And so I don't know what... There's a saying that you can't, uh, it's very hard to solve a problem at the level of consciousness that created it. Mm. And so what would happen would be a leap in human consciousness where all of these fragmented parts that exist inside people, all the things they've repressed, the parts of them that society, uh, you know, through socialization has, you know, broken away from them or told are not useful. All of those would be integrated and going towards something better. And I can't predict what that would look like externally because someone who is whole and integrated and in a whole and integrated society full of people who are like that 
is going to see things that I can't imagine now. It's, it is in a way beyond the current level of consciousness that I am and that most people are to try to imagine what that would be. That's the goal. Now, um, sounds like enlightenment. Yeah. I mean, like there, that, you know, enlightenment I have heard described as the idea that, uh, every aspect of you is conscious, that you are conscious of everything, not just of yourself, but in all of the world and universe. Um, it is, you know, one of the, the articles I wrote was about this concept of a forever war, that if you pick uh, a, a goal that is essentially unachievable, that you can actually achieve a lot in pursuit of that goal. Yeah, an ideal. And I think that um, enlightenment is kind of a functionally good one to choose in that what what you would be doing there is just continually integrating and becoming more conscious. And even if you don't reach full, you know, awareness of, you know, Buddha, Bodhisattva status, like getting there along the way still feels pretty good. And, and if, let's say that, you know, if all that we achieve is that people have a happier childhood, mm. well, that's still pretty good too, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think though a lot of people would say that their childhood was, wasn't that bad um, or they had some trauma, but, you know, they got over it. It, it didn't really affect them that much. Um, you know, maybe those are all defense mechanisms. Maybe they're not. I mean, maybe they just had a, a different childhood. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think some of those people might be telling the truth, but, uh, you know, that that is not the universal experience. It's not what most people I've seen report. Well, I, I guess the other thing I would just say, though, is that we've definitely come a long way from where we used to be, even, you know, 150 years ago. So as far as the treatment of children is concerned. So, I mean, we had a functional society back then. Uh, maybe it was a little bit more brutal than it is now. Um, I mean, someone like – it's interesting that you bring in Foucault because Foucault actually makes the argument that what we've actually done is we've we've um, – we've outsourced our brutalization into like these weird institutions. And so instead of having a public hanging, we put you in a jail cell for 20 years yeah. and it seems less brutal because you don't see it. I would say the same is true of a lot of trauma and the treatment of children. So, okay, well, no one is openly beating their child now. Uh, but instead we, instead of prison, we lock them in the school system for 18 years. And, um, there's hospital birth and yeah. there's the separations that occur around sending both parents off to work and then putting the child in daycare. Mm. I think that I would agree with his critique that a lot of the cruelties of society have just become more hidden. And in some ways there's a lot that has been solved and they're better. Um, but there's still some that are really bad that we just don't see. Which, by the way, the circumcision focus of the book is one of those. Yeah. Um, so given that, I mean, you wrote this book. It's interesting. People can read it. They can decide for themselves what they think about it. I'm still processing. Um, that being said, given that for people that have either been subjected to this or people that have participated in this system, uh, we sort of can't do, we can't undo the past. What are some steps um, that people can take on an individual level, you know, who don't need to become activists to start to right some of these wrongs. And also, okay, so there's two parts to this question. One, what can individuals do to start to um, break out of the system? That's what the show is about. And then the second part is for individuals that have been directly affected, that is traumatized by this, what are some of the work that you know about just in terms of recovering, healing, getting past this? So on the individual, there's two parts that there's the individual and the social or systemic. Yes. Um, Let, let's uh, do the social systemic first. Okay. Uh, no, well, whatever. Do whatever order you, you think is best. Well, the individual is in some way easier because okay. that's the place where people have the most power. And any healing method that you would use for early life trauma or sexual abuse or anything like that would apply here. Like anything that works there on those types of issues would work on this. 
Um, there's also something called foreskin restoration, <laughs> which is where people take the remaining skin they have and stretch it over time. Uh, I've got a whole podcast episode on that if you're okay, so inclined. Uh, I don't, why would someone want to do that? I have to ask. Um, two two re reasons. The most common is that even though you don't get the unique nerve endings of that part of the body back, you do get the covering. And a lot of people report that uh, basically sex feels better, that you have all some of the function recovered. Okay. Um, and including men who were circumcised as adults, they report this. Um, the second is that there's some people who feel like that through doing that, they're taking back control of their body. In other words, I didn't have choice over this. Okay. And now doing this, I have control. I get to decide what my body yeah. is or what it looks okay, like. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, I did some uh, research recently um, with the help of Ella, who's a popular sex researcher and Twitter personality, or I guess ex-personality now. Um looking at how much men would pay for regeneration. So there's this idea that some people have, well, you could use regenerative medicine, stem cells, things like that to regrow missing limbs from the body. Yeah. And what we found is that there was a significant portion of men who would pay over $20,000 for that, which if you extrapolate it to the entire United States um, and the amount of men that are circumcised means it's over a $200 million market just in the United States. So I think that there are, and there are some research groups that are working on that. They're trying to figure that out. Uh, so in the future, regenerative medicine might have a physical solution there. And whoever does that is going to be rich because, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you've looked in your spam folder recently, uh, improving that area of the body, let's say, is a very uh, thing that people are interested in, even if they're not willing to talk about it publicly. Yeah. Um, and so just... Even if the the research we did indicates that there's a significant portion of men that would pay, you know, f at least five figures for that. So um, that on the and, and that, by the way, that would occur if there was a change in consciousness. So there has to be. Well, I, OK, OK. So, I, I mean, the physical regeneration is interesting. Yeah. But, but you're it's also, not actually the root of the problem, right? Yeah. I mean, on the social level, the systemic level. Yeah. I think it comes through. In a lot of ways, the ideas of critical social justice are empowering in the sense that they say there's all these social systems and all these social systems are doing these various things to you, but um, you get to choose how much you want to participate in those once you're aware of them. Like you can decide, and especially with the treatment of children, like you get to just, you know, there are these things that are larger trends in society that might try to influence your children and the ways that you treat them, but you also have a, do have a lot of power there and you can decide to do things differently with them. Um, you can change your language and be more conscious of your language. So even things of like using the phrase intact instead of uncircumcised, like we wouldn't call you, uh, you know, un, you mentioned gallbladder, I think, ungallbladdered. Yeah. yeah. Like you just, like you wouldn't say that someone is, uh, you know, ungallbladder surgery. You just say that they're, you know, natural. Right, like, <laughs> you wouldn't say anything. No one exactly, and so no one would be talking. About there's it. a change in language that can occur. A change in um, it's also the attitudes that people have towards children, mm -hmm. um, and and acknowledge the the simplest. The simplest is just acknowledging their feelings. It's it's as simple as like if your child is mad, letting them that it's okay, know know that it's okay to feel that. Even even if the behavior associated with it, you know, or like breaking something or whatever, like that might not be something you have to set a boundary for, but the feeling is okay. Mm -hmm. um, so on the on the social level, I think that uh, there's a lot of systems and activism that you could do, but uh, um, again, like the individual change is just choosing is your shift in consciousness and and how much you want to participate in those systems or not. Like a lot of tyranny is opt in. Like you have to send, you know, you have to send your kid to the compulsory schooling. You have to choose like where they're going to be born. It's very simple to opt out of a lot of those things. All right. Well, I think that gives people a very good place to um, start working on this if they decide that they want to take it up. And um, thanks for writing this. A uh, really interesting book. So, but you are a you are a multifaceted guy. Uh, this is obviously uh, you've got this book. You've got your documentary and work you've done in the past. Uh, you also have 
another book that you've released recently, The Gods of AI. Um, before we sign off today, do you want to briefly just talk a little about, about your new book? And then maybe we can also get into what might be upcoming next from you. Yeah. So The Gods of AI is a AI-generated art book that is based around the thesis that you can use AI, and in particular AI image generators, to get a view into people's collective consciousness. So AI image generators are trained on every image that exists that they can find, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if I was to try to create a picture of a concept, I would be drawing from the art that I've seen, which is less than, you know, if I was to spend my whole lifetime looking at art, it is less than what these machines can look at. So they're trained on essentially humanity's collective visual representation of things. And so one of the things that I did when I first started playing- That's been put on the internet. Yes, that, that's been documented. Um, and so one of the things that I did when I was first playing with these is I would just try to get it to generate like weird abstract concepts like faith. Draw me a picture of faith. What does faith look like? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it would come back with something that was really interesting. And when it does that, it's drawing on this training from humanities, you know, collective visual history. And so I, 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 as I started to do this, started to notice interesting things that you could learn about human consciousness based on the way that a machine would try to represent concepts. And so what I did is I started putting in like the God of various concepts. The God of language was one of the first ones I did. And I got this uh, like open book with this like glowing wise old man rising out of it. I was like, that's really interesting. Like that is kind of a good representation of what the divine form of language would be. Uh, so I did like over 20,000 images, just all sorts of weird different prompts and uh, then collected them in this book, each with a commentary of like what I think this shows about human consciousness. So for mm -hmm. example, I did heaven and hell. Uh, heaven is totally empty, spacious white clouds and there's no people there. And hell is full of people. You know, it's that saying like hell is other people. And I think, it's, <laughs> I think there's something there that humans don't have an image of what heaven looks like with other people, but we definitely know what hell looks like with other people. And so it was like, that's sort of an interesting thing that the, the you know, this image generator found in terms of the, and by it was consistent, all the images right. of heaven so, are so like there's empty like, clouds. There are these and, patterns that are embedded in all the different human representations of heaven and hell that yes. we've created. Yes. And, and if you were to give an individual human artist, they would draw what, like, what their personal representation of heaven is, but across all of the images this is trained on, like there is a consistent yeah. pattern of heaven being fluffy white clouds. And you get aggregate heaven and aggregate hell. Exactly. And so it's looking at the aggregate of various spiritual and philosophical concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course it also, you can, it's like the, the previous book we were talking about, you can read it on multiple levels. On one level, it's a very beautiful art book and it's this, you know, nice. It's a good coffee table book. Yeah, it would be a great coffee table book. Yeah. And, and, it. and at the same time, you can also do this sort of deeper philosophical look at human consciousness. Mm. That's super interesting. It's almost like um, the, it's like a Jungian, like the machine's understanding of the yeah. human collective unconscious. I don't know. It's, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's like, what it, what is it think our collective consciousness around certain concepts right. is? Right. Because right. because Jung uh, believed that there was such a thing as the collective unconscious. And the collective unconscious was uh, manifested in these traditions of symbols, right, that were carried out in various cultures and also in the commonalities between symbols with different cultures. And that fundamentally the the collective, like our our um our internal psychology is represented symbolically, right? In both both literally in symbols like the, the mandalas are very common in Jungian works, as well as of course what people would know as as like collective archetypes, right? Different archetypal figures, and and the whole point is that the human psyche is inherently symbolic in nature. It's actually not ling it's not. Linguistic in the sense that the base understanding of reality that we have is not a bunch of like prepositional phrases yeah. in language. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting project because weirdly we're taking, yeah, we're taking all of these symbols and we're getting these 
almost Jungian images out of it. I think, yeah, a Jungian would be very interested in this kind of work. It's been a long time since I've studied him, so uh, I can't articulate it very well. But okay, so that's interesting. What else are you working on? The two next big projects are uh, a novel that's going to deal with some of the ideas of trauma and fragmentation that we talked about in this episode. I don't want to say too much about it, um, except that it's very fantasy. Mm. And then the other is I'm trying to get the rights to a novel about that deals with AI. And that I've been, so I, I learned a lot of the AI image tools generating stuff for this book, uh, The Gods of AI, and the video AI tools are getting even more powerful. And so I think I could do a film about AI with AI. It's yeah, I have- st Still human actors. I have some but, people you know. we'll, we'll get in touch with after the show about this, but um, have you tried Dolly 3 yet? I've not played with it yet. You should play with it. Okay. I started playing with it yesterday. Um, not because not because of this book, but actually because uh, there were a bunch of images have been floating around Twitter and it's getting memefied. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's challenging to keep up with the AI stuff because it's new every week. So like Dolly Three, their new version came out like a week ago from our current recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still on Mid Journey. So well, you can yeah, I have a Mid Journey. Mid Journey's great. Great. Uh, Dolly Three is like next level. All right. I, I mean, literally like. Um, there's some things it doesn't do as well as Mid Journey, I think. Part of the reason I, I want to do this next film with AI tools and about AI is that I think by the time the script is ready, hmm. all of the tools will be completely different and there's going to be this like- to keep updating it. Yeah, but it's also going to, I think that there's going to be this thing in filmmaking where AI is going to be cool and new for a very brief period and then it's just going to be how everything is done. And you saw the same thing with CG- um, when Gollum came out in Lord of the Rings, that was cool and new. And people were like, wow, they made a whole character with CG. That's so cool. And now people are like, ah, oh, CG, it's in everything, right? Like it's not, there's just an expectation when people go to a film that you, the, the filmmakers can make anything. And I think AI is going to go through the same thing where there's just going to be a little window where it's cool and new. And then like, that's just going to be how people are making movies. And and then it'll, the cool thing will be like, wow, they shot on all real locations. Like they actually like went out and built a set. That's so wild. Even though that's how that's all done An now. An analog set. An analog set. Yeah. Practical sets. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think the story that I want to tell would work really well with those tools. So. All right. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that, uh, People that are interested, go out and uh, get the book and check out your other AI stuff. And I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out next. Thank you.